And why does George Soros have all of this power? Because he keeps donating so much money to the Democrats? Why does George Soros want to see the collapse of America? Powerful the media are, yeah. and the media are the tip of the spear for the left, and it's George Soros who's funding it. It's, yeah. it's almost like he's an evil person in a Batman movie. Billionaire hedge fund manager and philanthropist George Soros has been the boogeyman of the Republican Party for over 20 years. From his funding of institutions of higher learning in former Soviet republics, to his donations to liberal causes like marijuana legalization and same-sex marriage in the United States, to his multi-million dollar campaign contributions to progressive prosecutors and democratic politicians, Soros is playing the same game that conservatives apparently think is reserved only for them, injecting as much private private billionaire money into politics as possible in order to sway outcomes. And while there are other billionaires using their money to promote liberal and democratic causes, none has reached the level of vilification of George Soros. The label Soros backed is enough to send conservatives reeling on Twitter, with very real and very devastating consequences in the real world. This is due in part to the sheer size of George Soros's donations over the years. By some estimates, he has given away about $32 billion to various causes. But this is also due to straight-up anti-Semitism. At the beginning, the prejudice was veiled in quasi-intellectual rhetoric, but with the election of Donald Trump, conservatives have become all the more comfortable saying the quiet part out loud, and the dog whistles have reverberated through far-right supporters and resulted in real-world violence that conservative leaders are able to wave off as isolated incidents that have nothing to do with their own words or beliefs. The reality is that George Soros is an easy scapegoat for the fear-mongering and anti-Semitism that conservatives are so good at, and the hatred has reached fever pitch in recent years. This is why conservatives hate George Soros. Roll the intro. Thank you to my partner on today's video, Trade Coffee. If you didn't know this about me, I love coffee. Okay, espresso, French press, pour over, drip, decaf, half calf, full calf, I want it all. And Trade helps you discover great coffee from the best local roasters around. They have over 450 different coffees from dark roasts to blends to rare roasts to decaf and everything in between. So you'll be sure to find something that you absolutely love. Trade recently sent me PT's Coffee, a decaf blend from Chiapas, Mexico. I loved this coffee. It was smooth and chocolatey. Mm. Trade's matching algorithm will curate your perfect next cup as well. And they have flexible subscription plans so you can pick what fits your lifestyle and tastes all in one. And this stuff is roasted fresh to order, either pre-ground or whole bean, so you know you're getting the freshest possible coffee. Plus, it comes shipped right to your door, and you know I love a convenient moment. So what are you even waiting for? Click my link below or go to drinktrade.com slash Lija and get a free bag of coffee with any subscription. Thanks, Trade. So who is George Soros? Let's get a little background on this 93-year-old multi-billionaire so that we have some context for why the right is so freaking terrified of him. Born in Hungary in 1930, George Soros was 14 during the Nazi occupation of Hungary in 1944, a dark period that witnessed the death of over half a million Hungarian Jews in the matter of a couple months. Soros's Jewish family managed to evade this fate by changing their last name from the German-Jewish Schwartz to Soros. They secured false identity papers, masked their Jewish heritage, and helped others escape as well. The post-war era saw the rise of communists in Hungary, prompting Soros to leave his homeland. In 1947, at the age of 17, he relocated to London, where he juggled jobs as a railway porter and nightclub waiter to finance his education at the prestigious London School of Economics. This was a transformative period for Soros, both academically and philosophically. Studying under the renowned philosopher Karl Popper, Soros was deeply influenced by the concept of an open in society, a democratic framework where individual rights are respected and diverse opinions coexist peacefully. By 1951, Soros had earned his Bachelor of Science in Philosophy, and three years later, a Master of Science also in Philosophy. These academic pursuits, however, weren't devoid of challenges. Although Soros had aspired to remain in academia as a professor, his grades weren't that great, laying the foundation for what would become a formidable career in investment in the United States, where he moved in 1956 at the age of 26. So let that be a lesson for you, kids. Got bad grades? Don't worry, just go into finance instead. 
Soros's initial foray into the world of finance began at the Merchant Bank, Singer and Friedlander in London, and subsequently at FM Mayer in New York, where he specialized in European stocks. This focus on European securities became a hallmark of his early career, offering a unique niche at a time when these stocks were just beginning to gain traction with U.S. institutional investors. He had a unique perspective on markets and developed the theory of reflexivity. This theory, grounded in his studies under Karl Popper at the London School of Economics, postulated that market values were often influenced by the perceptions and beliefs of participants, not just economic fundamentalism. In Soros' view, this interconnectedness between perception and reality could result in pronounced market cycles, both booms and busts. In 1966, then a vice president at Arnold and S. Bleichroder, Soros started a fund with $100,000 of the firm's money to experiment with his fledgling trading strategies. By 1969, he set up his own hedge fund called Double Eagle with $4 million of investor capital, including $250,000 of his own money. One year later, he founded Soros Fund Management, with Double Eagle as the basis of the business, growing the fund to over $12 million in three years. In 1973, he founded the Quantum Fund, which since its inception has generated over $40 billion. As of October 2023, George Soros is worth $6.7 billion and has given away around $32 billion of his fortune to philanthropic and political causes. In 1979, leveraging his considerable financial acumen and resources, George Soros founded the Open Society Foundations. Designated as a network of foundations and projects, OSF now spans more than 100 countries, championing democracy, transparency, and human rights. The 1980s saw Soros extending his reach to communist Hungary, endorsing an open exchange of ideas by financially backing academic exchanges with the West, and endorsing burgeoning independent cultural initiatives. The landscape of Europe dramatically changed with the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989. Soros established the Central European University, aiming to nurture a new era of critical thinking within the academic circles of the new Eastern European communist countries. His vision, however, was not restricted to Europe. From criticizing the war on drugs, to being at the forefront of America's medical marijuana movement and advocating for same-sex marriage rights, Soros's philanthropic activities have been expansive and generally revolved around his philosophical dedication to the idea of creating and furthering open societies. Between 1979 and 2017, this commitment was reflected in his donations to OSF, amounting to over $12 billion, fostering civil initiatives, promoting transparency, and buttressing educational institutions across the world. While his his work, like funding pro-democratic movements, was credited with influencing political landscapes such as the Rose Revolution in Georgia, Soros is often vilified the world over for his influence on politics and culture. In Hungary, his native homeland, leaders like Viktor Orban, aligned with figures like Russia's Vladimir Putin, have cast a suspicious eye on the activities of the Open Society Foundations. The significant funding provided to Central European University campuses and other institutions in post-Cold War nations placed Soros in a unique and powerful position, enabling him to counter mainstream narratives and challenge established political systems. This, in turn, has made Soros a contentious figure, simultaneously celebrated for his dedication to liberal causes and demonized in conservative circles as an influential puppet master. Viktor Orban, Hungary's prime minister, came to power in 2010 and sought out the advice of American political consultants to help him amass power and to justify his increasingly nationalist, authoritarian ruling style. But he didn't just go with any political consultant. He went with a guy by the name of Arthur Finkelstein, a guy who had worked with everyone from Trump to Reagan to Nixon and was known for making liberal a dirty word. He was known for his style of politics called Finkelfink. The main premise? Find a single person, the perfect enemy, and then get the people riled up about that one person so that they show up and vote out of fear of their opponent. It's all about picking the perfect enemy as the face of a larger issue and to distract from your own shitty policy. So for example, you don't talk about going after the Taliban, you talk about going after Osama bin Laden. He was the ultimate enemy, and the means for going after him were less important than just getting him. That's the idea. And after consulting with Arthur Finkelstein, Orban came up with the perfect enemy, George Soros, the outsider, international, liberal Jew, promoting critical thinking in the people that Orban was trying to control. 
The government has accused Soros and his many foundations of ulterior motives on the continent, particularly relating to the European refugee crisis. They went on an aggressive media campaign against him, using posters with Soros's image to foster hostility. Terms like the Stop Soros laws emerged, intending to criminalize assistance to illegal immigrants and even taxing organizations perceived as promoting migration. The vilification of George Soros in Hungary is emblematic of deeper societal tensions, and much of it is rooted in age-old prejudices, particularly anti-Semitism. Although not always overtly stated, the campaigns against Soros have often echoed classic anti-Semitic tropes, reinventing them for contemporary political uses. Soros is portrayed as a shadowy puppet master, manipulating global events for his gain. This notion of Jews as secretive, powerful manipulators pulling strings from behind the scenes can be traced back to notorious books like The Protocols of the Elders of Zion. Viktor Orban's speeches about Soros have been particularly telling. In one 2018 speech, he said, we are fighting an enemy that is different from us. Not open, but hiding. Not straightforward, but crafty. Not honest, but base. Not national, but international. Does not believe in working, but speculates with money. Does not have its own homeland, but feels it owns the whole world. These descriptions parallel those same age-old anti-Semitic tropes of Jews as deceitful, rootless cosmopolitans who owe no loyalty to any nation. The Hungarian government's assertion that Soros has a hidden agenda, especially with respect to the European refugee crisis, plays into age-old conspiracy theories about Jews orchestrating world events. Despite no concrete evidence of Soros attempting to flood Hungary with migrants, the narrative remains potent and politically useful. And this clearly anti-Semitic language used against George Soros is also used the world over, especially in the United States, relating to his use of his vast fortune for political influence. It was only in the 2004 presidential election that Soros started using his money to influence U.S. politics, donating $23.5 million to groups whose objective was to unseat President George W. Bush. He contributed heavily to super PACs supporting Democratic figures like President Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton, and was notably the country's largest donor in the 2022 elections, donating a staggering $128.5 million to back the Democratic Party. But it's not just high-profile national politics. Soros has been notably involved in local campaigns, supporting district attorney races to attempt to get progressive DAs elected who will address the disproportionate charges for nonviolent crimes affecting people of color and tackle the U.S.'s notoriously high incarceration rates. He's also been a staunch supporter of cannabis legalization, backing initiatives in multiple states and providing substantial funds to organizations like the Drug Policy Alliance. Also, in an endeavor to reshape the criminal justice landscape, he's actively funded reform mine prosecutors and supported civil rights group like the Color of Change PAC. Yet, with such significant influence comes backlash. Soros' progressive activism, combined with his vast donations, made him a prime target for conservative conspiracy theories. His backing of progressive causes during President Barack Obama's tenure especially marked a turning point, propelling Soros into the limelight as a conservative adversary. Claims, whether baseless suggestions that his wealth might be derived from drug money or other unfounded conspiracy theories, have become an anti-Semitic dog whistle for the right. The election of Donald Trump as the 45th president of the United States marked a discernible shift in the political rhetoric of the country, and Trump's rhetoric played fast and loose with traditional norms and created the rise of a bolder conservative discourse, particularly when it came to anti-Semitism and George Soros. Trump and his cronies have used George Soros as a convenient scapegoat for pretty much everything. When Trump faced criminal charges in New York, remember those ones relating to his hush money payments made to Stormy Daniels? Rather than confronting the charges head on, the campaign narrative quickly shifted the focus towards Soros. The Trump team sent out emails stating that Soros was attempting to bleed our campaign dry by dragging us through witch hunt after witch hunt. This insinuation, devoid of evidence, feeds into the conspiracy theory that Soros is manipulating global events from the shadows. This is a not-so-subtle nod to QAnon conspiracy theories that posit an international cabal of elites and Jews are running the world. The association of Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg with Soros became a recurring theme in right-wing criticisms of that case. With no concrete evidence, leading figures like Florida Governor Ron DeSantis and Ohio Senator J.D. Vance frequently dropped the term Soros-backed when discussing Bragg. This seemingly innocuous phrase, when unpacked, reveals a pretty sinister undertone. It implies that Bragg's actions are not independent, but are instead being orchestrated by Soros. This narrative, again, plays into the anti-Semitic trope of Jews
Jewish people having an undue and malevolent influence over global affairs. The claims were based on the fact that Soros had donated about a million dollars to a political action committee that then gave money to Alvin Bragg's election campaign. So it's certainly a fitting criticism to say that Alvin Bragg is one of the many prosecutors that have been elected in an effort by many to push progressive prosecutors into power. And it's even fitting to say, yeah, some of Soros' money was probably funneled through the PAC to Alvin Bragg. It's entirely another thing to say that Alvin Bragg is Soros-backed, implying that Soros, ever the conniving Jew, has an influence over Bragg and how he carries out his job day to day as part of a plot to attack Trump. The populist approach of Trump's presidency was a fertile ground for the magnification of Soros as a principal antagonist. During Trump's tenure, the term globalists became an insidious buzzword in conservative circles. Often used historically as a euphemism for Jews, this term, along with the increasing attacks on Soros, painted a picture hard to deny. Anti-Semitic sentiments were becoming mainstream in American right-wing discourse. Not only was Soros' Jewish heritage highlighted, but his character was also grotesquely distorted to fit anti-Semitic stereotypes, with some also confusingly, even falsely claiming he was a Nazi sympathizer. The anti-Soros sentiments are not restricted to America. Globally, particularly in Central Europe, Soros has been positioned as a nefarious influence, challenging national sovereignty and pushing a globalist agenda. With American politics echoing these sentiments, the vilification of Soros risks becoming a mainstay in conservative narratives. These views embolden the already present anti-Semitic sentiments, making them more palatable and less fringe. And the number of conspiracy theories that revolve around George Soros on the right are pretty staggering and largely all anti-Semitic. Let's go down a list, shall we? The European migrant crisis. Soros has been accused of being behind the European migrant crisis and personally importing migrants to European countries. The Hungarian government specifically took aim at Soros through an expensive poster campaign, implying his involvement in an international cabal that includes other Jews and Freemasons. Tucker Carlson made a whole documentary about it called Hungary vs. Soros. Carlson portrayed Soros as the mastermind behind Hungary's supposed decline into chaos, suggesting he's orchestrating a global liberal assault on traditional values via the importation of brown immigrants to disrupt the happy lives of white Hungarians. Black Lives Matter protests. Soros has been accused of personally funding the BLM protests that erupted after the murder of George Floyd here in Minneapolis, a claim that's been roundly refuted by BLM leaders. He's also been accused of funding Antifa, an unorganized group of anti-fascist activists who don't really have a central fundraising platform and are generally horizontal and grassroots organized in a way that doesn't really translate well to billionaire donations. There's no, you know, tax write-offs or anything. And the theory goes even further to say that the entire situation, George Floyd's murder and the subsequent protests, were all a scheme to come in and destabilize the United States. In fact, he's been tied to numerous protests, including those against the appointment of Brett Kavanaugh and also BLM protests in Ferguson, Missouri. It's all George's fault. The 2018 migrant caravan. Before the 2018 midterms, the Trump administration and his cronies tried to claim that the migrant caravan of immigrants coming to the border from Central America was orchestrated and paid for by Soros, even showing video of money being handed out to immigrants, footage that was later thoroughly debunked. This goes right along with the Great Replacement Theory, the idea that Democrats, with Soros as the most conspicuous liberal billionaire and an easy target, are importing immigrants into the United States to replace white, real Americans with immigrants who will vote Democrat. A theory that, once again, has been thoroughly debunked. You can check out my video on why conservatives hate immigrants for more. This also bleeds into the white genocide conspiracy theory, that not only are whites being replaced with new immigrant babies, but that the end goal is for white people to be systematically taken out and replaced by black and brown immigrants. The Charlottesville Unite the Right rally in 2017. Yes, somehow conservatives have even managed to explain away their own heinous behavior with George Soros. The idea being that he planted and orchestrated the Unite the Right rally to sway public opinion against Republicans, and that even the video of the truck driving through the crowd that day was staged and paid for by Soros. Voter fraud. Florida, Missouri, and West Virginia pulled out of a 34-state bipartisan coalition that were members of the Electronic Registration Information Center, which allows officials to cross-reference voter rolls with other states to detect voter fraud, a system which is rife with inaccuracies, which we talked about in my video about why conservatives are obsessed with voter fraud. So, like, I'm not mad that they pulled out of the agreement, necessarily, but the reason they pulled out of their own system for confirming their own conspiracy theory about voter fraud is because the system was originally founded in part by Pew Charitable Trusts, which in turn receives funding from Open Society Foundations, the George Soros nonprofit. Like, the system runs using taxpayer money, but the fact that it was created by a foundation that got money from a Soros foundation was enough to fully pull out. COVID-19. George Soros did that. 
all in an effort to destabilize the U.S. He funded the creation of a global superbug just to throw us off our game. And some of these conspiracy theories have been either overtly touted by political and influential figures on the right. So let's introduce something called COVID, and they did it, and they did it for a couple of reasons. One of the big reasons was, was to steal an election. Or have been nodded to or allowed to flourish under their watch. And while it still might be frowned upon to make overtly and literal anti-Semitic remarks if you're a politician, the veil is thin enough that followers of the far right have gotten the message. If Twitter is any indication, which it is, where users tweet things like, George Soros is paying for this. He is a Jew. America bows to the Jew. And Soros is every bit the subversive, parasitic conspirator these people make him out to be. The the problem they always neglect to mention is the fact that he's a Jew. As with many of the violent right-wing dog whistles, they don't have to say the thing out loud. They can insinuate it, and their followers know what they mean. Though, until the election of Donald Trump, the anti-Semitism had to be a bit more buttoned up. Now that he and his cronies and other far-right political nutjobs have moved the needle on what's acceptable to say as a public figure or politician, those same public figures and politicians have begun to say the quiet parts out loud, with tangible, violent, and dire results. In October 2018, Soros received a mysterious package delivered to his home. Inside the bubble-wrapped envelope was a photograph of Soros marked with a red X. Alongside it, a six-inch plastic pipe, a small clock, a battery, wiring, and a black powder. A dozen other similar packages were also sent to other leading Democrats, including Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton. The packages were eventually traced back to a white van covered in pro-Trump and anti-Democrat stickers parked in a supermarket parking lot in Florida, which sounds about right. Eventually, a man named Caesar Sayoc was arrested in connection with the pipe bombs, and people who knew him said he was absolutely obsessed with George Soros. But of course, immediately, the right-wing media claimed that Soros himself had orchestrated the bomb plot, with Rush Limbaugh saying, Republicans just don't do this kind of thing. Which is wild, but okay. When Trump was discussing the attacks at a White House reception, someone in the audience yelled, Soros, lock him up. And Trump seemed amused by the statement. Caesar Sayoc pleaded guilty to all 65 counts against him and was sentenced to 20 years in prison. But the dangers of this rhetoric of Trump silently condoning the blaming of Soros for this violent attack on Democrats, of the growing anti-Semitic sentiment that was allowed to flourish and actively promoted by Trump, was and is more dangerous than some unexploded pipe bombs. On October 27th, 2018, just five days after the pipe bomb was delivered to Soros's house, a white man armed with an assault rifle and three handguns walked into a synagogue in Pittsburgh and opened fire, murdering 11 Jewish people. It was the worst act of anti-Semitic violence in U.S. history, and it was carried out by a man obsessed with George Soros, who believed that white genocide was being orchestrated by Soros on a global scale. This type of violence is the consequence of growing anti-Semitic dog whistles and overt anti-Semitic comments made by or condoned by prominent right-wing media and leaders. This has pushed the needle on what's considered acceptable to say openly, and attacks on Soros have increased in recent years, along with a broader increase in incidents of anti-Semitic attacks. The Anti-Defamation League said that in 2022, U.S. anti-Semitic incidents reached their highest level since the ADL began recording them in 1979. The ADL has also found that the volume of hate speech on Twitter has grown dramatically since Elon Musk took over. Musk himself has made negative, hyperbolic claims against Soros, saying he hates humanity, and openly condoning or allowing the anti-Semitic speech against Soros to continue under his watch and in his comment section. The theories surrounding Soros are an inseparable separately intertwined with anti-Semitism, even when his Jewish heritage isn't explicitly mentioned. Conspiracy theories about Soros providing financial backing to non-white immigrants and sinister global plots tap into long-standing harmful stereotypes about Jewish people, creating a potent brew of xenophobia, racism, and anti-Semitism. When these conspiracy theories are vocalized and legitimized by public figures or widely disseminated on social platforms, they act as gateways to wider anti-Semitic attitudes and actions, propelling the cycle of hatred and violence. None of this is to say, however, that there aren't valid critiques of George Soros. As always, eat the rich. No one should be a billionaire. We learned in my video about the dark world of philanthropy that rich people accumulate wealth off the backs of underpaid labor, whether you own the business that employs them or simply trade in its stocks, and then take that money and wield it in whatever way they see fit. Even if I support the same causes he supports, I am still against the very fact that he has the money to give in the first place. Whether he supports conservative or liberal causes, I am still very uncomfortable that a single person can inject hundreds of millions of dollars into our political system to sway it in the direction he decides is right. No one 
one should be able to do that. Where it becomes anti-Semitic is when you say that this man is swaying politics to his will in a secret and conniving way that's part of a larger scheme to infiltrate politics and bring a new world order across the globe. Not only does that play into anti-Semitic QAnon conspiracies that can lead to violence against Jewish people, it's also attributing way too much power to one individual. As Joseph Usinski, professor of political science at the University of Miami has put it, it becomes deranged when we start ascribing superhuman powers to one person, when we give them the ability not just to have some sway or a say in the conversation, but to control everything. The reality is that George Soros is one billionaire among many that has spent his life trying to amass wealth so that he could then use it based on what he thinks is best. The difference is that he's a Jewish liberal, which makes him an easy target for conspiracy theories that blur the truth, which is that no one person should ever be able to amass that much wealth or power. And the solution is twofold. First, we need to call out anti-Semitism for what it is, and we cannot let our politicians get away with saying it or condoning it. Many will cry that their anti-Semitism is protected First Amendment speech, and in many instances, it is. But our ability to see it and condemn it for what it is is also protected speech, so we need to be drowning it out and naming it, so politicians and right-wing leaders have no way to wave away their actions with claims of plausible deniability. Anti-Semitism should have no place in politics in the U.S. or anywhere else. And while we're on the subject, as an aside, a lot of you have asked me to make a video about what's happening in Israel and Palestine. It would be presumptuous and really ignorant of me to think that I have any place making a video about a conflict that is incredibly nuanced. But I also think silence in these instances like this is also irresponsible. So I'll just say that condemning the violent actions of the Israeli government, which has committed violent atrocities against Palestinian people, it's not the same as anti-Semitism. Condemning Hamas for its horrific actions that are nothing less than crimes against humanity, it's not the same as taking Israel's side. The reason why discussing the Israel-Palestine conflict is so difficult is because it fully and utterly defies black and white thinking. And we generally as humans really struggle with anything other than black and white thinking. So maybe read a book about it or try to educate yourself in some way before taking a firm stance on either side. There are many books about the issue, try a Google search, but maybe check out On Palestine by Noam Chomsky and Elon Pape, or My Promised Land, The Triumph and Tragedy of Israel by Ari Shavit to start. Again, I'm not an authority on any of this, I just encourage you to try to learn about the nuance and perhaps question the hardline black and white stance that many Western governments are taking. Okay, like I said, the solution is twofold. First, anti-Semitism has no place here. Second, we need to get money out of our politics. I talk about this in every single video, because with every new issue I examine related to why America is so fucked up, it always, always, always comes down to money in politics. Billionaires should not exist. Period. I don't care if you're liberal. So many issues would be resolved or at least would foster more democratic participation and response from our elected officials if the interests of businesses and wealthy private individuals weren't allowed to trump the votes of average Americans. I don't care what the Supreme Court says, the free speech rights of a corporation should not be equal to the free speech rights of individual humans. The free speech rights of a rich person should not be louder than the free speech rights of average Americans. It is so fucked up that that's not the case. OpenSecrets.org provides a lot of information about money and politics and action items you can take to help call for more transparency. CitizensTakeAction.org is also pushing for regulating money and politics and has developed an amendment to the constitution that would override misguided Supreme Court decisions and allow Congress and the states to put limits on money spent on elections and lobbying efforts. So I encourage you to learn more, donate, and spread the word. And if you like this video, you might also like my video all about the dark world of philanthropy. Thank you to my Patreon supporters, including my newest patrons, and an extra special shout out to my multi-platinum patrons, Sophia Sams, Anthony Giles, and Brett Piantek. If you're interested in behind the scenes content, access to my research and show notes, content about my dog and all sorts of other stuff, consider joining me over on Patreon today. Thanks so much for watching, have a good day, Bye bye